All right, so I've been doing this uh, game server for a while now. So this game server that I'm building is going to be an auto-scaling game server. There's going to be the authentication and server determination kind of aspect. And then there's going to be this matchmaking server style that auto-scales and able to spawn a bunch of processes or a bunch of fly IO machines or really any way that I abstract it out as to what a game server is. And so the first thing I did is just build this all locally. So every single server represents actually just a process that runs. And then I'm able to simulate a bunch of connections joining and staying for some amount of time and then quitting. And so I kind of do this whole simulation. Effectively, it's fuzz testing and then just asserts everywhere in my program for anything that could break. And if anything could break or expectations should not be met, I assert and throw the uh, and just like completely blow up. And if you can see right here at the very, very end, you can see I had a mismatch in state at the end of all of this. I expected certain uh, set of connections to a server to be true. And apparently that certain set of connections to the server was in fact not true at all and everything blew up. So there we go. That's just what happened. Hooray. Uh, so with that, how did I kind of build all of this. Well, I built a lot of this off the back of Squeal Light. And the reason why I chose uh, Squeal Light is that locally, I can literally just point to a file. So my sim file, which is going to be my test uh, main file, it is just simply, uh, you know, temp sim db. But my actual production stuff is going to be Terso. So I'm able to have this entire local environment that sets up, uses all the same select statements, uses all the same table creation statements and all that. And I effectively can tear things or bring things up and tear things down. When I find certain aspects of the program that I wish to unit test, I can actually create a file that is a database in a specific condition. And then I can, you know, take my matchmaking server, hydrate it up and say, hey, here you go. Let's have a new connection. And it should be able to tell me where does the connection go, which is pretty cool. Like to be able to use all of this and have such cool integration testing, it makes me pretty happy. But the reason why I'm making all this and all these things that I'm explaining is that I decided to use SQLite as my form, uh, will you say, of discovery. My ability to keep track of what servers are running, where they're running, and the state of them. Obviously, I'll have to do a lot of work both on the authentication side and everything, along with the game server side. So if something crashes, say on the game server side, I need or hopefully will be able to signal to the database, hey, I'm crashed, the server's done, don't make any more connections. And of course, on the, you know, the matchmaking side, I'm gonna have to ping all of the available items and make sure that they're actually responding to some health checks and all that. So it's kind of this fun little problem. I've always wanted to do it because I've never built auto scaling in any capacity. So before just jumping on and using Terraform or Open Tofu, Kubernetes, any of those things, instead just build something myself, see how it goes, understand the sharp edges, really understand it thoroughly through, and then use something off the shelf. And so with that, I've been doing SQLite, and I decided this would be a great opportunity to use AI because I know SQL. I know it pretty well. I can do your joins and all that business, and I used to do a lot of Hive queries and all that when I was at Netflix, but now I'm using SQLite, so I'm like, okay, I don't know the exact SQL syntax, right? Is it create or update, or is it insert or replace, right? Well, it turns out it's insert or replace. So kind of going through all that, and also I don't know SQLX, which is a Golang library, which I just started off with SQLX. I'm probably going to migrate to SQLC at some point, but I wanted to create this, and I just wanted to try it because I figured I could actually use SQLX and SQLite, the actual you know SQLite, and I should be able to use them both, and AI should be able to guide me through this process because I already effect effectively get everything. I just don't know this exact dialect. Feels like a great problem for AI, right? And so I started building this and I kind of got all my like creation stuff done, uh, which was pretty fun. Actually, this was a great experience with AI. Here's the creation thing. And all I did was go here and just say, hey, here is my game object. Could you just hand me the SQLite creation stuff? And it sure enough, it effectively did. And so I was very, very happy about that. And so there's some good experience uh, doing this. But something kind of started to creep in that I didn't really realize. You know, SDB exec versus query row uh, versus select. Each one of these have a behavior. And instead of taking the time and do what I normally do, which is just read through the basics of the docs, understand all the methods kind of available, the general like heart of the law of the library. Instead, I just used an AI 
specifically chat GPT-40 to kind of speed me through to the exact answer. And I quickly was able to create the configs, create indices, be able to not only do that, but also create the kind of CRUD operations that is needed to be able to control these servers and the state of the servers. And I thought, hey, this is going to be really, really awesome. I'm going to be able to fly through and get this done. So I start up my servers, boom, crash, database is locked. And I'm a bit confused by this because, you know, I'm kind of a Postgres Andy when I used to do a lot of post, or I was technically was a my squeal Andy when I used to do a lot of databases. I've never seen this or had this. I've never been able to use a database where it just does not it, I thought the locking and all that kind of came for free. Like, right, like if I'm going to write to a row and also, or write to a table and also read from a table, it's going to do the right thing and hand me back the answer when it's ready to hand me back the answer, but not squeal light, right? I was not ready for this kind of a basic experience. And so I got really confused. Why? Well, that's because I found my answer and I was able to get everything up and running in pretty much the exact shape and almost none of the code changed from what the AI generated. But I didn't understand what I was using. I didn't understand the sharp edges. So things were breaking. So I had to kind of inversely learn and take a large program and try to figure out why things were going wrong as opposed to just reading the docs. And so this kind of statement that I'm realizing again about AI is that AI can save you, say, two hours of reading the doc, but it's probably going to cost you four hours of runtime debugging. And that's really the big takeaway that I'm kind of having at this point. And it made me really realize a phrase that I heard from DHH and really kind of settle it into my heart, which is, it is way more fun to be competent. Am I sad that I used the AI and kind of didn't realize the things I didn't learn, shortcutted all the processes where it was able to deliver value really quickly? Yeah, I actually kind of am. I wish I would have just done that to begin with because honestly, I would have spent less time. I would have arrived to the same conclusion that I arrived to in this code. And lastly, I would not. I would have been able to understand these things and not just be such a fool and waste so much time. And so the reason why I'm kind of stating these things or talking to you about all this stuff is that this is just a big passion of mine, which is that I want to see people excited to program. And I think AI is super cool. Like it, I can't believe we live in a world where I can describe in English and get out results that are actually pretty amazing. Like that, that's pretty wild. Like especially with something like Fly.io, I could just open up ChatGPT and be like, hey, I want to be able to control Fly.io from a curl command. Could you please point me to the correct place in the documentation? And could you please give me an example curl? And it did it. I actually did and I actually wrote my Golang program and my auto scaling based around those curl commands and the documentation. So it's like super cool. I was able to really kind of plow through a lot of things. But at the exact same time, I also had these really bad experiences with this. I really don't know a lot of the fly IO stuff. I kind of skipped the documentation. I got the answers I wanted. And part of me goes, geez, you know what you should have done? Should have spent those couple hours because I guarantee you, you'd probably be having a better time. You'd feel more prepared to be able to build these things. And so I just don't want to effectively make progress at the cost of dividends. And if you're not familiar with dividends, the whole idea behind them is that you buy into a stock and every single quarter, every single month, half a year, once a year, you get some payout. And that payout usually results in it reinvesting into the stock. And then over time, it slowly grows every single year. And then every single year, they raise their dividend amount. And so you get paid a little bit more every single year and you reinvest, so you get paid a little bit more. Again, compounding interest, right? And when you go and you read the docs and you take the time to just learn something properly, it's slower. It's not as sexy. It's not as fun. You don't just immediately deliver value, but you deliver dividends. And six months down the line, 12 months down the line, you just have such a vast knowledge of all these different parts because you just took the few hours it takes to become really familiar with something. And so I'm hoping that I can kind of deliver this message well to you, which is just don't value speed of delivery above everything else. It's been a huge mistake of mine over the course of my career is favoring that. And I just wanted to talk about it, really. And I, I, I worry a lot about the AIs. Uh, and the reason why I worry is that you will get all the answers you've ever wanted. There's complicated program, programs you're going to be able to solve fast. You're going to be able to do so many cool things. 
but it likely is going to come at a cost of understanding because you'll just move on. You got the answer. And every now and then, you'll end up in a problem where it actually would have been smarter and you would have had the dividend payment up front. I don't know. It's just more fun to be competent. Anyways, I just wanted to say all those words at you guys. Hey, I hope I hope you appreciate this. This is kind of like the Vim Engine channel now. I'm just going to start talking about the things I'm doing, and I'm just going to talk about code and my thoughts on coding, codes, and life of coding. If you like that, hey, you know, let me know that you actually like this kind of format. It's a lot more informal. There was no script here. This was all straight from the heart. I literally did three takes first when I didn't have, I just didn't have this tiger style document up that I was going to go over. And then this, this time that I went over it, we didn't, we didn't even talk about the tiger style. It doesn't really matter. I'll talk about that next time. Okay. Hey, 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 the name is the, the yap dude, is this yap You know what? I interviewed DHH. That man puts me to shame. Not only does is his context window 69 for 420 feet long, he could he could just go and he can just go and he actually rounds off his thoughts with cohesive points. Absolutely incredible. A Jed. Oh, wrong one. <laughs>